Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this morning. Lord, there's no doubt in my mind that there's heavy hearts and full minds here this morning, Lord, and even those that would listen to this message later. And Lord, we need to be lifted up. And Lord, it is really only you that can lift our countenance. But Lord, that's partly on us too, to lift our heads on purpose, to look for you. And so Lord, we seek your face this morning. We ask that you would infuse us with hope. That you would relieve some of the stress that we feel from this life. Lord, that we would look into your word, even when it's a difficult word, Lord. And we would know that your intentions for us are good and perfect. Because you love us, Lord. You love us so much that you came, you came, Lord, and you died a purposeful death, a miserable death. And then you beat the grave for us. And so, Lord, we're thankful for that this morning, Lord. I pray that would be our hope. If that be our only hope, Lord, I pray that that would be sufficient. Lord, we open your word now, and we just ask that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would give us ammunition for these days, that you would make us strong in these days, that you would cast off, Lord, and cast away the things that weigh us down. Help us to be realistic about this life. And part of that, Lord, would be knowing that our hope is in the next and not this. And so, Lord, we give you a wide berth this morning to speak to us, to move as your will intends, to touch each of us, to fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Lord, we just present ourselves to you this morning as just empty vessels. And we ask that you would fill us, that you would teach us. Lord, that you would continue in that very profound way to love us as we love you. And we thank you, Lord, in advance. We praise your holy name. We ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We left off at the end of chapter 7 of Acts last week. I'm going to review the last several verses, if you want to start there with me, in the end of chapter 7. And we're not going to go very far into 8. But in chapter 7, we saw Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit, brought before the Sanhedrin, the ruling class of the Jews of that day there in Jerusalem. He was brought before them, facing false accusations, and he answered them in his testimony and in his sermon about their accusations. But more importantly, he took them on a journey through the Old Testament scriptures and pointed out to them how many of the messengers of God they had turned their backs on, that they had refused to listen to, and those that they had even killed. And in a sense, without saying so, he was including himself in that picture because he was bringing them once again a message. And the message was that their worship had been given to things and not the creator of all things. And he was showing them that their worship was important, but the place that they worshipped wasn't necessarily important. That they put so much weight in the temple, they put so much weight in the law that Moses brought forth, and yet they were turning their backs on the worship of the king, of God himself. And so he lays that out, and then they respond. They respond in the exact way that he had pointed out that they had responded to other messengers of God. I want you to pick up with me in verse 54 there in chapter 7. And speaking of the Sanhedrin, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then he cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
And they stoned Stephen as he was as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Falling asleep, meaning that he passed on to the next life. That he was immediately in the presence of his Lord, which needs to be our hope as well about how ever this life ends. And we made some parallels last week, and I'm not going to repeat them, but many parallels between the way that Stephen left this world, many parallels with the way that Jesus left this world as far as being sacrificed, and more importantly, how he prayed and what he prayed. And then we talked about the picture of how these men reacted to him with the gnashing of teeth, and how much that was really like the picture of hell that Jesus had left with us. I just want to point out two more places where there's a similarity with what Jesus went through that wasn't mentioned last week. You know, there are psalms in the book of Psalms that we would call messianic psalms. That although they speak to us in general as believers and followers of Jesus and God, they're messianic psalms in the sense that you see Jesus in the psalm. Either he speaking, he responding, he being spoken to or of. And one of those, actually a psalm that was very important to my final decision to be a child of God, to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, is Psalm 22. <clears throat> and in that psalm, there's a picture there of Jesus being crucified. You would have to have your eyes open to the language that's being spoken of. But I believe Psalm 22 tells us sort of first person the experience that Jesus had as he looked around the cross on that day. And what he was able to perceive with spiritual eyes, although those around would have just seen the, the men that were crucifying him, the small crowd that had joined there. But in particular, two verses out of that Psalm 22, verse 12 and 13, Jesus speaking in that Psalm says, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging, roaring lion. I believe the picture there is Jesus is seeing beyond the veil, which he was very capable of doing because he was God. But he was seeing in that moment the demonic forces that believed that they were having the success that they had sought, that they were putting a death to the Savior, that they were putting a, to death the Son of God and all the hope of humanity. And he saw around that cross those that were celebrating the demonic forces. And it really is a picture of everything we should know about our enemy. And so much of what we're going to talk about today is a focus on that. Now some could take me to task and say, why would we in church give the enemy that much attention? Well, I'll tell you in my personal opinion, why I would give the enemy so much attention is because he gives so much attention to you and I. And if we don't know our enemy, we will not know his tactics. We will know not what to do in order to fight him. I was taken to task many years ago because someone said I should never, never speak of the enemy in church. N never mention the name Satan. And I thought, well, with Jesus as my Lord and my example, I'm in good company. Because he spoke more of hell than he did of heaven. But what Jesus faced on that cross, what Stephen faced in that crowd, was the same spirit that you and I wage war with. Or at least that spirit that wages war with us. Because we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, your adversary, your adversary, my adversary, our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's his whole purpose. Now some, I think, believe erroneously that Satan only hates those that are counted as children of God. Satan hates humanity. Period. Period. And we need to understand that. Amongst humanity, he hates most those that call on the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. But when we look at his work on earth, we need to understand that he is waging war with humanity. More so in the days in which we live than any time previously, I believe. 
And because he has ratcheted up and moved up the thermostat of heat against humanity, we can only imagine above that number how high he'll raise the heat against the church. And if there's nothing else you hear from me this morning, hear this. We dare not be prepared. We dare not be unprepared for what's coming. Let's go to chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now, as ugly as that picture is, something good was happening. As ugly as any picture is here on earth, in the midst of it, something good is happening. And I'm going to encourage you that everything we speak about this morning, you would keep that in mind. Because I'm going to paint a picture as we talk about our challenges. And if that's all you hear, and you don't notice that there's hope in with what I'm saying, then all you'll do is find yourself in fear, and you'll be focusing on the wrong thing. But it says there in those three verses, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. You know, throughout the New Testament epistles, one of the scenes that we see occur more, not, not more and more, but often, is Paul making a collection of monies amongst the churches to send back to Jerusalem. One of the reasons they were having problems in Jerusalem is because when the pilgrimage, pilgrimage was made into Jerusalem, as was required for the men of the Jewish faith during the High Holy Days, the festival times, and the day of Pentecost came and the church was born, well, that was just too good to go back home. So many that were not normally in Jerusalem stayed. The city swelled and the numbers didn't go back out as they normally would because there was so much going on. There was so much going on that it was too much for the city to handle. And so there was a need because now people were hungry, not enough food, they needed shelter, all the things that you can imagine. God had to intervene. God had to intervene because he needed to get those people to go back out with what they'd experienced and what they now know, especially those that were now born again, full of the Spirit, to go out back to the countryside, back to their villages and start to take that word forth. It's the same thing that we're commissioned to do. It may be easy for us just to have a really good Sunday and we just lock the doors and no one goes home. Eventually we're going to run out of food. Yes, even in this church. We're going to run out of food. And who knows what else would complicate things that we might not be able to stay together. No, we're to come in here to be built up, to be refreshed, to be refilled, to be taught and sent out. Sent out to take what we now know and what we've been reminded of and what we're full of out into the world so in the sense God put his foot in the middle of the stagnation and chased them out of Jerusalem yes through persecution which he does he'll bring persecution to the church to get the church to do what it needs to do matter of fact this was a commission back in the first chapter of the book of Acts verse 8 Jesus said you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And we'll find that's exactly where these people went when they were pushed out of the city. Now just one thing I want to point out. We don't know who these were that buried Stephen. It's not a big issue. I just want to point it out. What, in the, and I don't have an answer for it. Was the, were these brothers of Stephen in the faith that stayed behind and took care of that? Or were these just devout Jewish men that knew that burial needed to take place that maybe were even convicted as they watched this witness of Stephen go up into the heavens? We don't know. But we see this action of Saul. 
this evil intent that Saul had for the church. And it says there that Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. Now, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul describes himself as being so zealous in his religious faith that he persecuted the church. That word zealous means heated, on fire. Now, Saul's supervision over this execution of Stephen was just one example of his involvement in the persecution. Now, he consented, it says. What does that word mean? If we go to the Greek, it means to approve. More so, it means to be pleased with. This man Saul took pleasure in what he was doing. Which means he felt that he was doing something right. That he was being righteous about what he was doing. That he was serving a higher cause. I would say very likely that he felt he was serving God. Which is interesting because we're told that those days will come again. The persecution will come to the house of God by those who believe that they're doing things for God. So he was pleased in what he was doing. Now, this Saul, the Saul of Tarsus, we know him by his Roman name, Paul, the Apostle Paul. This man would eventually become a disciple of the Lord Jesus. He eventually would be numbered amongst the Apostles. He would eventually write a great deal of the New Testament. I did a little study on that. I mean, how much of the New Testament did he write? Well, if you just go on books, he wrote 11%. But if you go on actual words that he wrote, he wrote 28% of the New Testament. Now, about himself, Paul wrote these words. He said, I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And then in Acts chapter 26, verse 11, he describes what was probably his greatest regret. And there he says this, he says, I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So he regretted it later. But at first, as he took these actions, he had pleasure. What was his influence for the pleasure that he had? What was it that he was really being loyal to as he took this persecution forward? And the question I have, and I want us to ask the question, and then I want to go on to consider the answer. Is there something about Saul that can help us understand the Antichrist spirit? operating in the world today. The spirit that increasingly comes against the church. Now I wrestled with what I'm about to say, whether I'd say it or not this morning. But you know, part of my burden, and when I say burden, that's not to get you to feel sorry for me. I'm just trying to explain where my thoughts lie, where my heart is at. But part of my burden, when I consider this, this privilege that I have to speak the word of God to us as a local body of Christ. My burden is this. One, I know that my life has been called in the order of a watchman. So I have no ability to say no to the things that I see and I come to know when it comes to having to relay those to you. There were years ago when I was much less experienced and I'm still very little experienced, but very much less experienced, where I would bring a message and it would be so heavy that I forgot to bring in the hope. And I had people talk to me about that. You know, you got to give people hope. But you know what? As much as I want to give everybody hope, the reality is that we have to deal with the weight. We have to deal with the weight of this life. We have to be honest with ourselves about where we are at this moment. And so my burden is this. I never want to discount. I never want to lessen. I never want to water down the truth of God. But I never want to shy away from telling you what I believe you need to know. 
And so I wrestle with those two sides of things. I wrestled with this message. It's been a long time, and I'm just being honest with you. It's been a long time since I've been nervous about a message. Why am I nervous? It's not that I'm not confident in what I want to share. But what I need you to do is I need you to pray right now in your spirit that you would hear what's being said. You would retain what's being said. And some of this is going to be rather academic. But I want you to know it because I believe it will affect how you go forth from this day. Dealing with how the world is making you feel. About the things that are stressing you out about the burdens that you carry, about the questions that you have about today and the future. And that's why I rested it three verses into this chapter. Because I think Paul is our example. What was motivating Paul? Now again, this Saul, this Paul, I'm going to go back and forth, excuse me, whichever name comes out of my mouth, same guy. Very religious man. Know that. Very religious man. I get nervous when somebody tells me, I'm. Re oh, you're just religious. Eesh. No. No, I'm not. I mean, maybe, maybe you can use that depending upon how you see that word. But as I understand that word and grew up understanding that word, no. No. Saul had a zeal for his faith. Again, heat passion he had a zeal for his faith in the things that he believed to be true i mean that's admirable in itself so many people have no conviction we have convictions i hope i hope all of our convictions line up with the truth of scripture and therefore they're not ours all we are then is in support of those we're the messenger that brings those forward we're the one that lives those things out as an example but Saul operated from a place of faith, took action against those that appeared as a threat to his religious beliefs, to his practices. And again, he believed his actions were right, and he believed that his actions were fair. We're dealing with people in this time frame in our lives, in our country, in our state, that truly believe that what they're doing is right. Now, some of them have probably had to compromise something deeper in order to arrive at that place. Some of them are conflicted even as they do those things, as they're in the process of convincing themselves that they're doing something right. And we're going to talk about some of those, what that compromise means. We're going to talk about what that confliction can look like, not just for them, but for us. Now, here's what I've believe is so important for you to understand the world has its own religion you know we tend to divide everything and, and i've came to this realization many years ago and i've been fighting it ever since the realization came because in my early christian training you know everything i heard from people that were trying to educate me trying to divide my new life of faith from the world that i came from but always talk about spiritual and secular. And I came to realize one day many years ago that it's all spiritual. Depends on what spirit we're talking about. It's all spiritual. So when we look at the world, we can't divide them really truly into believers and non-believers. We can say they're non-believers in the sense they don't believe in what we believe, but they are believers. And there's a great chance, and you see the examples of it throughout the Old Testament, that those that don't believe in the true God or his son are actually more zealous for what they believe in than we are for the truth. Which means their beliefs and the things that come from those beliefs are power. Not more powerful than the God that we serve, but they're powerful nonetheless. So the world has religion. Even those that would proclaim to have none. Even those that would stand on their case as an atheist. I love those people. I love atheists. I know God loves atheists. They have the most difficult task of all people, of all faith groups. Because they will argue until they drop on their knees 
that they don't believe in what they're arguing against. How can you argue against something that you don't believe in? They work really hard at it. But the world's religion goes by many titles. I'm just going to give you a list, and you could add to it, I'm sure. And I'm not going to define each one of these. If you want to know what one of them is, either come and ask me later, write it down, go look it up. But many titles. Humanism. I'm going to stop on that one just for the moment, because this is inter was interesting the first time I did it. If you ever get to go to a major library... I remember the last time I was in a major library was the library of the University of Oregon. It's a pretty big library. Not as big as some that I've been in. But every, if you ever get to go to a major library, go find the area of books on humanism. It is massive. It is massive. And you need to understand... Study humanism. Just look up the definition. I'm not going to give you one. That's your assignment. Go look up that one. Because if you understand what humanism is, you'll start to recognize it. You know, I, re I regret the fact that we no longer have a Christian bookstore in town. You know, I love books. I love bookstores. I love Christian bookstores. But I used to tell people it's one of the most dangerous places you can go. Because you go in there thinking this is a Christian bookstore, so everything in here must be good. You know, when the one was downtown, they got very used to me. Because it wasn't often, it was not often that I was in there that I didn't walk up and put a couple books on the table and say, you need to look at these. Or strongly, I'd say, get rid of these. Humanism encroaches, even in our faith. I said I wasn't going to go in through these. I just shut up and move on. Humanism, Darwinism, if you don't think that's a religion, then you don't understand. Materialism, Pantheonism, that may be one you want to look up. Ecumenicalism, which is growing. Globalism, yes, that's a religion. Scientism, probably one of the most pronounced religions of our day. Scientists, doctors, they become the new priest class. And our lives are being seriously impacted by them. So the world worships the God of isms. It's the world system. But allow me to sum up that whole list with one ism. Satanism. He is the prince of this world. He is the lord of the air. These are all worships of him. He has set them up to counterfeit truth so that when people worship that, he's getting what he has always wanted, and that's the worship of God's creation, mankind. Now, why Satanism? Why would I sum it up as that? Is it, can I give you a simple answer? I can give you a complex one. There's no problem with that. But Jesus said this. He said, if God is your father, it's because you love me. That's what Jesus said. If God is your father, it's because you love Jesus. But Jesus went on saying, if you don't love him, then God is not your father, and therefore the devil is. That's one of those black and white truths. That's one of those things that we don't really like saying. It sounds so, it just sounds so wrong, doesn't it? To look at someone who doesn't know the Lord and go, well, then you're worshiping Satan. That doesn't go over real big in witnessing situations. But it's a truth nonetheless. In John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus said, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. At the time that we're reading in Paul's life, Saul's life, before he became Paul, that was him. As religious as this man is, even though that he was looking really at the true father, he was yet worshiping the devil. He was bringing accusations and persecution against the people that were following after God in an authentic way. Jesus goes on in that verse, he says, The devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil didn't learn to lie. The devil is a lie. Not that he's not real, but he is the source of lying. He was the father of lies. What does that mean? That means anything apart from the truth of God is a lie. You can say, well, you know, they discovered this or they've come across that or this man. Dev-. I don't care. If it doesn't, if it doesn't come comfortably in line with the word of God, it is a lie. And that needs to be a warning for us. Because there's so many resources to feed us information. There are so many sources of great knowledge that we would absorb to figure out this life. And I'm not saying we should not chase anything. I'm just saying we need to be really careful to understand where it aligns and where it may not align with the Word of God. Because we bow down to powerful people. We bow down to worldly wisdom. We bow down to titles and authority given by man to men. And we are living in the days where we need to just wake up to that. And in our own lives, as much as we can, we need to say no to those things that are of the world, that are of the devil, that are purely religious and not the faith that we follow. So what is it about the unredeemed, the unregenerated person that causes him to seek after and do evil? Well, of course, like all things, Scripture tells us. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it tells us there the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's pretty black and white. Now, what does it mean, deceitful? What does it mean, desperately wicked? Well, in plain English, it means polluted and incurably sick. That's the condition of man apart from God. Born into that. And I know that's an ugly picture, but it is the truth. Because it takes us back to the fall. And that's now what we are apart from God. Born as a soul with a stillborn spirit. Seeking reconciliation with the Father who created us. Only renewed by faith in His Son. But God makes us a promise. If we'll put that faith in his son, then we're told by God, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. That's the promise. And so we're not doomed unless unless we choose to remain doomed. The world is not doomed, unable to come. Jesus wants all to come. He wants every soul redeemed. Will that happen? Of course not. But his arms are open to all that would call upon his name. Why else are the unredeemed and the unregenerated seeking to do, seeking after evil? It's because they operate from the flesh. They don't operate from that new heart, that new spirit that God puts puts within us. They have not become the new creation, the new creature that we become when we put our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when we look around the world and we see all of the things that we would count as evil, all the things that bother us, all the things that we wish weren't there, all the things that we would classify as wicked, it all comes back to flesh. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, about the works of the flesh, beginning in verse 19. And he said that the works of the flesh are evident. We don't even have to look for them. Especially those being people of the word, we should be able to go, yep, flesh, yep, flesh, yep, flesh, and never question why that's happening. We look out and we see unredeemed. We see unregenerated people working from the flesh because that's all they have. You and I. You and I were those people. 
you and I still fight that flesh. So we do not sit in judgment. But we need to be those that are wise about the things that we're seeing. Let's look at the list. The works of the flesh. And actually I could substitute the works of the devil. Adultery. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lewdness. Idolatry. Sorcery. Hatred. Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. There's that general category. That's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing. So we should not look with surprise. We should not look with fear. We should be able to stop, and we've talked a lot about this in the months past, we should be able to stop the anger before it comes because we realize what it is. We just look at it and go, yep, that's what that is. That's what that is. And then Paul warns us in chapter 8 of Romans, verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, which I would just add ways of the devil, you will die. Do I need to explain that? I'll go on. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, or you could say the deeds of the devil, you will live. So it is a life or death decision. It is a life or death decision. It is a decision that we feeble people, humanity, gets to make for itself regarding where it wants to be for eternity. God's given us a lot of responsibility over ourselves. You know, there's examples of human evil all through history. All through history. And we could go into these deep, and I'm going to fight the urge to do so. Think of all the communist regimes which should bring us some concern, considering there are many now in power, that that's exactly where they want to take us. Just in the 20th century alone, the numbers vary, but somewhere around 250 million people were murdered for the cause of communism. It's almost the population of our country. Nazi Germany. Millions of people slaughtered because of evil. Here's two things I would give you that you can go study because these are very, very important for where we're at today. Some of you may know of these, but I bet a lot of you don't. There was something that happened in 1971 called the Stanford Prison Experiment. And then earlier than that, in the 60s, there was something called the Milgram Experiences. Experiments, excuse me. Just as a very cursory overview, what they did is they took normal people, whatever that is, and they divided them into people that were under authority and those that were put into places of authority. And what they discovered during those experiments is the way that those under authority, even when they know that it's an exercise, will do just about anything they're told to do because they're under authority. What made the people in authority, in authority? They wore a white coat. They carried a clipboard. They were told that they were the authority. And what these people under them were willing to do because they were told to tells you everything you know, need to know about the weakness of the human spirit. And everything those in authority did to the people under them tells you everything you need to know about the evil in human, in humanity. These people did things that blew the minds of those that were putting the experiment together and observing it. Study those. Because I'm telling you, it's playing out today on the big screen. And there's no popcorn, there's no concessions, folks. It's what we're watching. The world is kowtowing to those that have just assumed authority. And our country, literally, have assumed authority. 
Look back as recent as the early 2000s in Iraq. There was a situ situation in a place called Abu Ghraib. Any man or woman that's ever been in uniform was disgusted by what they saw. The public was disgusted by what they saw, if they saw it. But these military people that were had Iraqi prisoners, it was abominable what they did to those prisoners. But they had the authority. And those prisoners went along with it because they were under that authority. Man is capable of things that we don't want. And I keep saying man and women, I'm talking mankind. We are capable of things. But by the grace of God, there go I. Every one of those works of the flesh is one thin moment away from you and I, apart from the Spirit of God. You would say, well, I'm not capable. Yes, you are. In the right circumstance, under the right pressure, turning your back on the power of God, we are all capable of these things. So we just should, be, should not be shocked when our fellow man or women do these things to us. But we need to understand their source. We need to understand that it's spiritual, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. What about the ongoing slavery in this world? You understand that at no time in history has there been more people enslaved than there are right now. And along with that would be human trafficking, sexual trafficking, children in such a high number that our minds just cease to consider it. What about abortion? What about abortion? And then even worse than that, we've seen in the last three years that it's not just simply of the elimination of a human life. It's actually the commodity that that child's body has become. The body parts are sold. The genetic material is used. So how long has this been going on? I mean, all this evil ruling and reigning. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That's pretty far back. Chapter 3, Genesis. It's been around since the beginning. A few chapters later, tells us that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. That wasn't too long after the garden. And as I've shared here before, if you were in the time that Jesus lived, which they call the second temple period, and you were to talk to a Jew of that day that knew his history, and you would ask, what was the source of evil? They wouldn't go back to Genesis chapter 3 and what the serpent did. They would have gone back to Genesis chapter 6 and the incursion from above and the relation that angelic beings had with human women and the offspring of them that were giants in the land that existed before and were told spiritually after the flood. That's what they believed was. One of the reasons was because a book that's external to the canon of scripture called Enoch was a book that they used just like their scripture. And they all knew it very well and believed it. And that book, better than most, teach what that period was like. So those, that verse as I just read, it, it speaks about that, what we call the antediluvian time. Antediluvian simply means before the flood. So here's the question somebody might ask, why should we care now? Well, here's the reason, and Jesus spoke it in Matthew chapter 24. He said, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came 
and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus said that. So if we're not concerned about the evil that happened before the flood that caused God to bring the flood, then we're not very concerned about what's coming upon the earth today. And you notice the description of what people were living like in those days. They were going about their life like nothing was wrong and nothing was coming. When there was this man who was preaching, preaching for a century and building a boat as big as a, as, that was big. You know how big that boat was? He was building a boat in a place where it had never rained. He was preaching the word of God. And they walked by him, I'm sure, day by day and just thought, oh my gosh, poor man. Poor man. Just as happens today with people that are trying to be prepared for what's coming. Now, God made a promise. Chapter 9, verse 11 of Genesis. He said, thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. That's good news. And if you know the story, you put the rainbow in the sky to assure us of that every time that we saw it. But, in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 6, Jesus spoke about another time that would come. And although not by fire, there would be a coming of a penalty. And he said this, he said, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectations of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now listen, those verses speak of the times that we call the tribulation. It's all laid out in the book of Revelation. But we, by Jesus' very instruction, are living in the time of the birth pangs. Those verses speak about when the things are coming will be given birth to. We are living in the time of the birth pangs, which means we are seeing these things begin to unfold. Many of them have been unfolding for a while. There are many signs that Jesus warned about that we should be recognizing now and preparing for now. You might recall, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? He gave quite a list. Most of you are familiar with that list. Most of those things we can look at today and back decades and go, well, they've been happening for a while but they're all increasing, both in intensity and regularity, and they will continue to do so. But there's one in there in particular, and I want to highlight it today. Amongst the things that Jesus listed, he said this in Matthew 24, verse 10, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Now, those words in Matthew 24, predominantly for the Jews, but by extension and application, we as the church must learn from them. And I bring this one up in particular because I believe amongst the signs in these days of what Jesus said was coming, the one that I think is right on the doorstep will be this, that many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another, and I'm speaking within the family of God. Because we're being divided. We've already been divided last year. Churches that don't meet anymore than churches that do. Churches that meet freely as we do and those that are still meeting under the mandates of the government. Take that a step further. When they start to tell us to do more, which will come in the, fourth, in the form of being told that we can do less, how will we respond to one another when we believe that what they're telling us to do is right and that your brother or sister across the aisle has decided not to do it. 
I think the biggest place that's coming is with the thing that they're erroneously entitling a vaccine. Quit calling it that. And if you don't believe what I'm about to say, that's because you personally have not looked into it. That is gene therapy. It is an unauthorized, excuse me, it's an authorized, unapproved gene modification of what God created. People are dying of it. People are being made sick by it. People are losing the control over their lives because of it. People are getting both rounds of the shot and still being tested positive for what the shot is for. They're telling us that there are variants much more serious building up everywhere. Same reason they give a flu shot every week, every year, allegedly to fight the newest, even though they're a year behind every time. What's going to happen in the church, in the body of Christ, when you have two sides to this argument? Those would have my opinion, which you have to have your own, and those that would say, oh no, this is for our best good. And even if you don't want to take it for yourself, take it so you protect someone else. You know, Yvonne and I lived for a decent amount of time in southern Spain. And when we lived in southern Spain, one of our favorite places to go was the rock, Gibraltar. We had friends on Gibraltar, church family there. We just loved being in Gibraltar. We lived about an hour and a half away. I was so heartbroken the other day. Just the initial numbers from the first go of, that's a small rock. There's not a lot of people there. It's actually surprising how many are on that rock, but still a small number. Just in that first week, 51 people died in the first round. And I'm probably going to get censored on YouTube for this, but I don't care. These challenges are coming, folks. And if not here, not in this house, it'll be between you and our brothers and sisters in another house. I was just told this morning, and I have not verified this, I was just told this morning that there's a document now that Oregon has put forth and it has something to do with that shot being put out to the public and how it's going to be put out to the public. And allegedly, they've got people now they are going to go around and solicit the churches to make sure their people are compliant. Forgive me if I don't tell you to be compliant. You have to make that decision for yourself. But I'm bringing these warnings because these are things that we are going to deal with. And if, you're not, and if we are not dealing with it in this house, we're going to know brothers and sisters in another house that we're going to have to counsel, that we're going to have to come alongside. The church is ripe for this. I think it's coming sooner than later. So that verse again, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So let's ask ourselves this question. What were the conditions in the days of Noah? What was going on before the flood? Now, we're not going to be able to give a complete, accurate picture of that because some of it is conjecture. Some of it comes from extra biblical texts, which I'm not going to get into. Because we need to know, are we actually seeing the same conditions today? I've got seven, seven causes of that antediluvian corruption, of the corruption before the flood. I want to go through those. The first one is this. These are things that were corrupting that time frame. And you can balance these with what you're seeing today. First one is this. There was an acknowledgement of God as Elohim, the creator, the benefactor, but not as Jehovah, the covenant God of mercy, not recognizing his holiness, not recognizing their own depravity, and therefore denying the absolute necessity of a mediator between God and man. Do we see that today? We see it, we see it in droves. Here was another thing that was going on. Even in those days, the upsetting of God's order, 
of male and female roles and the destruction of marriage as a God-ordained and sanctified relationship. The third one, rapid progress in the development of technology. Such advancements lessen, and this is one I really had to stop and think about as I wrote it. I never really gave it much thought. Rapid progress in development of technology, such advancements lessen the hardships of the curse, rendering life more easy and therefore more indulgent. God told us what this life would be, the hardships. He said it to Adam, he said it to Eve. And under the influence, I believe, of the evil one, we have worked and worked and worked and worked to make sure that we didn't have to live under that curse. And really, none of it's brought us anything good. It really hasn't. We like to think that we're progressing. We like to think that life is getting easier because of our advancements. We also like to think that those advancements are because really smart people have developed them, not recognizing the power of the the spirit, small s, that's behind so many of those advancements. You look at some of the science that you've heard me say this before, but you look at many of the breakthroughs in science today, and you cannot tell them apart from occult practices. They are delving into and messing with things they ought not to. And we're calling it wonderful science, wonderful advancements. The fourth one, an alliance between the true believers and the world, quickly resulting in a complete merger. Fifth one, a great increase in population. The guess is that the population before the flood was as great as it is now this world, or even greater. There's many that believe that their technology was as advanced, if not more so. We have been lied to about the caveman. We have been lied to. All those go back to evolution. All those go back to an explanation of history devoid of God himself. Sixth one, rejection of the preaching of God's holy word. And the seventh, an incursion from the heavens above and the appearance upon earth of beings from the principality of the air and their unlawful intercourse with the human race. And you say, well, at least we don't have to worry about that one again. You know, some will explain what happened in Genesis 6, not because there's those that would say, well, you know, angels could not have intercourse with human women. The Bible doesn't say that about anywhere. Matter of fact, there's a lot of evidence that they can take on full human form and influence this world however they choose to be, to be necessary. It says that they don't marry. Well, we can prove from this world you don't have to be married to have intercourse. But some would say it wasn't that at all. It was actually their sciences that manipulated the genes of the human body that God created. And from that science, these giants were born. I don't necessarily believe that. But what if that's the way it happens this time? We are being genetically modified by the genetically modified food we eat by things like what we just talked about earlier, by all the assault on our person, by the chemicals in our environment. I mean, there's so many things that we can make parallel with that, so don't dismiss that. We are rapidly moving down that road. Let me read you this paragraph from a book that speaks about that list. It says, These causes... To envelop the world in a, excuse me, these causes concurred to envelop the world in a sensuous mist which no ray of truth could penetrate. They brought about a total forgetfulness of God and disregard for his will. And thus, by removing the great center who alone is able to attract men from themselves, rendered the dwellers upon the earth so selfish and unscrupulous. Scrupulous, that the world was presently filled with lewdness, injustice, oppression, and bloodshed. It remains, therefore, for us to consider whether similar influences are now acting upon our own society. Here's what I want you to know. Those seven things I listed, they weren't mine. I modified them a little bit for today. That paragraph came from the same book that I got those seven areas. That book was written in 1876. 
It's a brilliant book. 145 years ago, the author of that book was already looking at the world and saying we must be in those end days that look so much like it did before the flood. So here we are 145 years later and we're asking the question, is this where we're at? <clears throat> Certainly more than that author was 145 years ago. So can you see, I have to ask, the parallels between the antediluvian times and our society today? Can you hear what I've shared from a 145-year-old source and deny that there's nothing new under the sun? Can you argue against the truth that the same spirit of evil that rules the air, has the whole world under its sway, has been alive and well on earth from the garden until now? Now, if you agree that we can't argue away these truths, then I want to ask a couple more questions. Why then is it so hard to believe that increasingly dark times are upon us and that they will increase? Why do so many believers deny that God meant what he said about the evils that existed before the flood and that they are destined to return? And why? As the list of seven things proved, do so many deny that we are, to some degree, in those days now? What is the cause of, of a believer struggling with this seemingly obvious proof of God's word? What is it that challenges the church to see clearly the things are coming upon the earth? Why is it so hard to rest in the truth that God is good while at the same time admitting that man and his world system are evil. And one more question. Why is it so difficult to combine the truth that things will become great and perfect in our heavenly life with the truth that in our earthly life we will have tribulations, trials, and persecution? That's what Jesus told us. He told, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Here's the reason I'm pushing this so hard. It's because I talk to people all the time. And I kind of share with them what I think, what I, what I see. And I see in their eyes, they agree. Yes, I see those things happening. I see those. Yes, it, it agrees. It agrees with scripture. But then almost immediately, there's a switch that turns. And it goes something like this, but it's all going to work out. We'll get back to normal someday. And I'm not saying cast that hope completely away. I'm just saying that those kind of thoughts can keep you from doing anything about where we're at and what's coming. And I know some are going to have a problem with what I'm saying this morning. Because it's going to sound, because you're only listening to one side of it, like I'm not giving hope. Like I'm saying there is no hope. And like I'm painting this picture that is just so dark that maybe next Sunday, you know what, I'm going to go to another church. That's your choice. I personally cannot, I cannot hold these things back. Because I care about you. I care about you, I love you, I hope you at least like me. And I want to see you prepared. So I'm going to introduce a couple concepts. And if you're listening to what these concepts are, they should help you make sense of this denial that the church suffers. And, how, and the fact that they find it so difficult to handle these truths. I think it's a concept that will help you understand your own difficulties accepting the reality of our day. And it may help you, I believe it would help you to understand why people you share with can't or won't listen to you. The first concept I want to introduce to you is something called normalcy bias. Some of you may know what that is. So this is going to get rather academic for a moment. And I know the hour is late, so deep breath, shake it off. Not like I haven't gone long before. A bias, you could use the word prejudice. A bias in a person's thinking, which leads them to disbelieve or minimize threat warnings. That's what a normalcy bias is. A person's thinking which leads them to disbelieve 
or minimize threat warnings. And because of this, individuals underestimate the likelihood of a disaster, when it might affect them, and its potential adverse effects. Normalcy bias causes many people to not adequately prepare for natural disasters or calamities caused by human error. It's been calculated that about 70% of people display normalcy bias during a disaster. If you've ever been in a disaster, you will witness personalities that in the midst of the disaster will swear that's not happening. They'll deny it. Normalcy bias can manifest in response to warnings about disasters and the actual catastrophes. Now such disasters, we could list them. Pandemics, when they're real. Motor vehicle accidents, natural disasters like earthquakes, tsunamis, a war. Normalcy bias has also been called analysis paralysis. It's also been called the ostrich effect, head in the sand. If you know any first responders, they sometimes talk about something called negative panic. Now, just to give some contrast, the opposite of normalcy bias is overreaction. Or what they might call a worst case scenario bias, in which just a small deviation from normality are dealt with as impending catastrophe. They see a little thing happen, they think everything's going to fall apart. But the contrast is watching everything fall apart and denying it's even happening. So in layman's terms, normalcy bias is that voice in your head that's telling you everything's going to be okay. And yes, with God, all things will eventually be okay. And with God's help, you can be okay in the midst of the things that you come against or that come against you. So again, there is hope, but there's a reality here that I want you to consider. Because those hopes that I gave you won't really matter if you are in denial that there are things actually happening or coming, things that are unfavorable and that will affect you. It's that wrong-headed thinking that leads people to not prepare for disasters. They're obviously coming. You know, a lot of what I'm sharing here is really big when it comes to survival situations. These are, this concept and the next one we give you are what causes people to die in a survival situation. Because they don't recognize that this is the mindset that they're in. Now again, Truth be told, if we die in the midst of what's coming, we're with the Lord. And so amen to that. Thank God for that. But I kind of stand on the side of, I don't know how much time there is between that and this. And so how am I going to get between that? How am I going to bridge that time frame? Listen. The things we're facing today and even the more things that I believe are coming are making us uncomfortable, downright disturbing, and costly to our well-being and to our peace of mind. For many, what we're experiencing is causing isolation, denial, and paralysis, as well as a whole host of negative emotions. I want you to think about this. There's two very close companions to sin. The first one is complacency, and the second one is compromise. And as we've explored, complacency can be the result of our normalcy bias. We don't believe it. We don't think it's going to be that bad. Probably isn't going to happen in my lifetime. The rapture's going to come and I'm going to be out of here. So I'm going to be complacent. I'm just going to wait until the bus shows up. But what of compromise? What happens within us when we compromise? So I'm going to introduce the second concept. But first, let me define what do I mean by compromise? Compromise, I, I wrote out, this is my definition. Willingly deciding against, by either words or behavior, 
our core beliefs, our morals, our principles, our values, etc. Willingly deciding against what we really believe. That's a compromise. These are the things I believe to be true, but I'm going to do something different for whatever reason motivated you. To get by, to get less of a penalty, to not have the penalty. And as Christians, it's willingly deciding against the tr truth of God's word. So again, what happens within us when we compromise? Well, that's something called cognitive dissonance. The second concept I'm introducing to you. Now listen, cognitive dissonance is induced when a person holds two contradictory beliefs or when a belief goes against an action that the person chose freely to perform. That kind of situation produces feelings of discomfort or guilt or even disgust in oneself. Often the individual strives to change one of their beliefs or behaviors in order to avoid being inconsistent. You know, in the scripture we read about something called hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a special case of cognitive dissonance produced when a person freely chooses to promote a behavior that they do not themselves partake of. People will try to reduce the dissonance, the discord, the difference between. Reduce that dissonance in their lives to relieve the discomfort they're experiencing. So how's that accomplished? Well, they either change their belief or they change their behavior. But what happens when the behavior is forced upon us and the belief that we have is rooted in God's truth? How do we resolve that? Do we risk the punishment of the imposer by changing the behavior or risk compromising God's truth and betray what we really believe to be true? I think that's where we're at. And I think we're going to be there a lot more in the future. Take, for example, the mask mandate the physical distancing rules, or a shot in the arm in order to be allowed to move about freely. Many, if not all of us, are currently in a state of cognitive dissonance. We've been forced into a situation when we have to decide how to resolve the dissonance and establish harmony. I believe that these areas of compromise are only the tip of the iceberg. It's my opinion that many more challenges and situations are coming and some of them will be significantly more difficult to navigate because of the penalties that are attached to them. Now understand, your normalcy bias could cause you to, to, to do nothing about this. So we were talking about cognitive dissonance, now I'm going back to normalcy bias. You could be in cognitive dissonance, but your normalcy bias could cause you not to do anything about it. You could choose to not give it much thought, believe it will pass and things will get better and the good times will return. So we have to understand that these two concepts can work together in tandem. A person can actually deny that anything bad has happened or even coming while all the while compromising their belief to go along with whatever is being asked in order to avoid the published consequence, not realizing that they are punishing themselves by not being honest about what's happening or how they feel, or what they believe, or what they know to be the right thing to do. And again, that's how people die in survival situations. That they find themselves in a situation where they've got to figure out a way to live, or the only other alternative is to die, and you choose, well, you know, this isn't so bad. I'm sure somebody will be along soon. I'm sure the weather will change. It won't be that cold tonight. I'll find food tomorrow. I mean, we can go down the list, but our mind plays tricks on us. Now some, and maybe I'll save you email and you can just talk to me directly. Some are going to be bothered by the fact I shared these two concepts. Because someone inevitably, either in this room or later because they watch it on tape, are going to get in touch with me and go, man, you're bringing that psychology stuff into church. Well, let me tell you what I think about that. Psychology, the field of psychology, has learned an awful lot of the truth about how we operate. Where psychology falls apart is how they apply the fix. 
the way that they tell you how to get over that or get past that or make that better. Because they start with the assumption that everybody's good. They don't believe in the concept of sin or fallen man. And so, yes, I just brought you two psychological concepts. And so, be mad at me if you want. You know, when I went to college just about my entire Navy career. I went to night school for years and years and years. I had like a triple major. Psychology, sociology, philosophy. I was immersed in the world. The first time I went back to class after getting saved was a psychology class. I was so uncomfortable. I couldn't understand. I was like, my skin was crawling. I'm like, this isn't right. And I changed everything over to business, which was worthless. But what I'm saying is I understand the dangers of psychology. So I'm just going to put that out there to disarm whatever you want to come at me with. Those two com concepts have a spiritual application. And I am encouraging you to understand that you very well either may be or will experience those two things. And it's my belief that we're in the midst of at least one of them right now. Because we're being forced into a situation by authority to do things that conflict with either our internal sense that God gave us of right and wrong or with the very word of God itself. And if we have many days left before the Lord comes for us, and that may be different for each of us depending upon however God has ordained our last days, then we need to consider such things. And now most of us come to church hoping there'll be some practical application to whatever we heard today. There's plenty of it here. This is a time to just shake out the cobwebs and truly decide where you're at in this process, what do you truly believe is going to happen, and work at least towards that. And if you're wrong, thank God. Well, depending on how it turns out. But you've got to do something. You can't sit and just ride this out. Jesus said, work out your own salvation, and I believe this is part of it. And do not try to do that apart from the power of God and the fellowship of your brothers and sisters. We don't have to be fearful of this. As a matter of fact, this should, this should give us such freedom. We, amongst all the people of the earth, know what's going on. We're the ones with the truth. We're the ones with the solution. We're the ones with the power of God and the Holy Spirit within us to walk through this and not be duped by it or drugged down by it or tripped up by it or killed by it. We are so privileged. But we need to operate from that place. But you need to decide today that you're going to do that. You need to decide today that you're going to learn to walk like this, to practice these things, to know the Word of God better. Because that's where your truth comes from. That's the weapon that you fight with. Sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. Don't wait until you get in that fight. You know, we are so versed in our minds of how we would fight something physically. So many of the men in here have messed, and I'm not saying no women, but most of the, a lot of the men have sat and played out scenario after scenario of how they're going to deal with some physical violence. And most of you are wrong. Because you actually don't know how you're going to react. Those of us that carry weapons, we think we got it all figured out. And we can protect ourselves against anything. When the fact is that that attack that comes is going to come in such a way that it's probably under 20 feet and you have four seconds to react. So in four seconds, you're going to assess the enemy... You're going to draw your shirt out of the way, grab your weapon, pull it up, get on target, pull the trigger, and neutralize the target. No, you're not. You're better off with a knife in that scenario. Why am I bringing that up? Because we play the same game spiritually. I got this figured out. I'll just pray when the time comes. But I guarantee that if we can't do it with a physical enemy, we're not going to be able to do it with a spiritual enemy. We need to be well practiced. Well practiced. 
We need to be able to pull that Word of God out within four seconds. You need to know how to say it and believe it. You need to fight with the Word of God. You need to fight in His mighty name. But it doesn't matter unless you believe that these are the times we're in. Jesus took them to task. You can look at the sky and discern the weather. But you don't know. But you don't know what God has said is coming. I want us to be strong. I want us to be prepared. You know how you get strong and prepared? Realize, one, you're not prepared and you're not strong. Those are the truths we must start with. You can always be more prepared. And unless you admit to your own weakness before the throne of God, you will not find the strength that He offers. Because you'll think you're sufficient in your own strength. I want to leave us with a couple of scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Seeing how far Saul that became Paul really went. He tells us this morning, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but the temptation will also make the way of escape that you will be able to bear it. Maybe that's one you should memorize. Everything I just presented this morning sounds so dire until you realize that God has said, although I'm presenting this to you, although I've allowed you to live during these days and see these things, I am not going to put you in a position that I can't get you out of. But once again, if you don't recognize the situation, then all the tools in your backpack ain't worth a darn. You need to know what the situation is. And one of the things I worry about in our life of faith is things that become too common. Things that we say too often. Even scriptures that just become, they roll off our tongue, but we never stop to consider them. Now, many of you that grew up in church grew up with one psalm that you probably memorized, and some of you still know it. And we say it so fast, or we read it along with someone else who's reciting it. And we say it so fast that it just becomes this really cool poetry. We got pictures in our mind, paintings, and, and, and it's just, oh, it's such a wonderful psalm. But have you stopped and really considered his words lately? And that's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare me a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Maybe that's another one you should revisit. Rememorize or memorize for the first time. Nothing I said this morning is encouraging you to believe that there's a lack of God's presence in your life. As a matter of fact, when we come into the hardest of times, I believe He's more present than at any other time. And sometimes that's just because that's when we're calling on Him. That's when we realize how badly we need Him. But he's telling us this morning that you're not going through anything that your brothers and sisters around the world are not going through. And if somehow there's still that rhetoric in your mind, but we're, we're America. Good luck with that one. That's become a half-peeled bumper sticker. We are people like the rest of the people of the earth. We've lived under a fallacy for a long time about what we are and what makes us different. And as in rapid fashion, we're becoming just like the rest of the world, which is the plan of those that have power over this world. Tell your brothers and sisters in foreign lands that there's no persecution in this life. It's just now finally made it to our shores. 
And the church is their target. They're speaking it clearly, out loud. They're not hiding a thing. And we don't yet know the extent that they're going to go through. Well, it's already late, so what's it matter? I'm going to close with reading you a psalm. I'm going to read you a psalm. We've just read it a couple times in recent months. But I just want to just wash you in this word this morning before you leave here. So that you can walk out of here with your head up. You can walk out of here praising God. You can walk out of here confident that He has given you all that you need for this life. All that you need for this life. And that right now, we're the diamond on that black piece of felt. We're shining ever brighter because the darkness is increasing. And so make sure that you see yourself as that. And understand you can see yourself that because His hand of protection is over you. He goes before you and He'll follow you from behind. Don't ever lack that confidence. But don't ever let that confidence overshadow the reality of the days that we live in. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you, have made, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me before I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now that word is very personal to the person, Jesus it's really Jesus speaking through so much about the relationship he has with his father. And yet we are told by Jesus himself to abide in him. We are hidden in him. So the protection given to him by his father is ours as long as we abide in him. It's when we're outside the light that we have a problem. But he has told us to be in the light as he is in the light. There is where our protection is. There is where our mind will be clear. And we won't have to deal with either of those concepts that I offered this morning. Because we'll let all of our thoughts be captured by Him. Be encouraged. Be encouraged, but be wise. Worship, ushers. My only instruction for this time of communion is to commune. That's simply my instruction. Commune. Sit before his feet. Consider what those elements are that you hold in your hand, what they represent. Let that bring you to that moment. 
that he gave up his body and shed his blood for you and I. And understand that if he expected that of us, then it would have been our cross. And if he expected that of us, then we would have been told that that's what we were to do. But he didn't tell us that. He went to that cross. One, because only he could, as the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God. But he did that so that you and I wouldn't have to. So cling to that this morning. Cling to that in thankfulness, in your worship as you sit before him this morning. And maybe inquire to what he would have you to do about what you heard today. So that you're not caught off guard. And that if your mind needs to be clear this morning and from this moment forward, that he would clear it for you. But also understand as you take that cup and you take that bread, that it is just a picture of how great his love is for each of you. And I would say rest in that. But Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word, for your instruction, Lord. I believe some of it was probably hard to hear or difficult or maybe not even desired, Lord. But I pray that it would penetrate and that it would be an example for our days ahead and our thinking and how we order our steps. But Lord, let us remember that it is truly you, ultimately, that orders our steps. So let us cling to you, Lord, allowing the confession of our weakness that you might make us strong. Lord, I know that you intend to preserve us until that very moment that we're in your presence. But Lord, let us walk that walk in anticipation with wisdom. With wisdom and a vigilance, Lord, that your spirit would encourage within us. Again, we just thank you and we praise you. We ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.